Stay away, stay away from the major sins Ignore the whispers of the Shia tent Oh Lord, have mercy on our souls Stay away, stay away from the major sins Ignore the whispers of the Shia tent Oh Lord, have mercy on our souls بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على أشرف خلق الله سيدنا محمد بن عبد الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه All the praise and all the glory is due to Allah And I bear witness that there is no God but Allah and that Muhammad is his last prophet and messenger May the blessings and peace of Allah be upon our prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم his family, his companions, and those who followed his path up to the day of judgment. My dear respected brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And welcome back to a new episode of Healing Hearts. In Healing Hearts, we are moving ahead to purify and rectify and properly approaching our heart, the most important organ in the whole body of the Muslim. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Ala inna fil jasadi mudra, Ida saluhat saluha al jasadu kullu, Wa ida fasadat fasad al jasadu kullu, Ala wa hiya al qalb. Certainly, there is a piece of flesh in the body, in which if it is sound, the whole body is sound. And if it is corrupt, the whole body is corrupt. It is definitely the heart. One of the steps of purifying and rectifying our hearts is how to approach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the scholars say when a bird flies, it cannot actually fly through one wing. It has to fly through two wings. Otherwise, it will fall. Such is the case of a Muslim. When he flies to Allah to reach his destination in the hereafter, he goes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through two wings, a wing of fear and a wing of hope. In the wing of fear, he does not exaggerate in fearing Allah to the extent that he may become frustrated or despaired. Because when a person exaggerates and becomes excessive in that field, he will give up. And don't also be excessive in the side of hope, because if you have excessive hope to the extreme, you may actually fall prey to not actively working for the sake of Allah. You will also give up. So a person should have a balance between fear and hope. When he goes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he combines those two basic characteristics. He certainly knows that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a severe punishment in the hereafter. They also makes sure that Allah is compassionate and merciful, whose mercy covers what is between the heavens and the earth. The mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala covers the jinn and the humans, and even the animals. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saw a woman in a battle, she missed her baby. She was looking after him for long hours until she immediately found him on the street. The woman started bringing and taking her child and she stuck him into her breast and the child started being nursed. So the Prophet وسلم, looked at his companions and said, do you think that this woman is going to put her son in the fire? They said, no, definitely not. Then the Prophet ﷺ said, such is the case of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He has mercy to the people or to humans more than the mercy of this woman to her son. And to Allah is the excellent example and the greatest example. So Allah subhanahu has mercy, compassion. 
But this compassion and this mercy is actually very close to the righteous and also it is close to people who err and make mistakes. So a person should actually have that type of fear. Even if when he makes a righteous deed, a person should not actually be deceived by his righteous deeds. That's why the scholars said a person may commit a sin and it draws him closer to Allah. And he may make a righteous and good deed and it drives him far away from Allah. How come a person may make a righteous deed that brings a bigger distance between him and Allah and he makes bad deed and evil deed and it draws him closer? Yes, because sometimes when a person makes righteous deeds and it breathes in him, a sense of arrogance, a sense of showing off, a sense of boasting what he does, thinking that he did something great. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to show him a punishment with regard to this, even if it is apparently a righteous deed. And on the other side, a person may make a sense, so he has a feeling of humiliation, a sense of submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and a quick repentance and reference to him so that he recognizes that he is a slave and he recognizes the glory of Allah and the great shortcomings that he had perpetrated against himself and the zulm, the injustice he made against himself so that he returns and he repents his sin so it draws him closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah revealed an ayah which is relevant to that meaning and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam recited it to Aisha radiyallahu anha. Allah said in the Quran, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ هُمْ مِنْ خَشْيَةِ رَبِّهِمْ مُشْفِقُونَ Those who are out of the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they feel that they are scared. وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ بِآيَاتِ رَبِّهِمْ يُؤْمِنُونَ And those who believe in the verses or in the signs of their Lord, وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ بِرَبِّهِمْ لَا يُشْرِكُونَ And those who do not associate anyone with Allah, with the Lord. وَالَّذِينَ يُؤْتُونَ مَا آتَوْ وَكُلُوبُهُمْ وَجِلَةٌ أَنَّهُمْ إِلَىٰ رَبِّهِمْ رَاجِعُونَ And those who give any charity, and they do and perform the righteous deeds, but they are afraid of their return back to Allah. أُولَٰئِكَ يُسَارِعُونَ فِي الْخَيْرَاتِ وَهُمْ لَهَا سَابِكُونَ Those are the people who compete in attaining the pleasure of Allah subhanahu. So Aisha radiallahu anha said, O Messenger of Allah, those verses were being revealed about people who commit theft and fornication, and they drink wine, and then they are afraid to return back to Allah to recompense them or to punish them according to their sins. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, No! daughter of a siddiq no ya aisha they are not those people they are the one who has sin those who compete with each other in pleasing the lord in going and doing righteous deeds but they are afraid that it might have been rejected they might not have been actually accepted by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so they have this type of fear from allah that they may or may not so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praised them in the Qur'an. So this is a type of fear that a person retains. This is a type of fear. When you do something, you are afraid whether Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted it or not. This is the cause why when a person finishes his prayer, what is the first thing that he is supposed to do after making assalamu alaikum, assalamu alaikum? What is he supposed to say? He is supposed according to the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to say, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah. I seek refuge in Allah three times. Why? What is the reason? Why he should seek Allah's forgiveness? Did he commit a fornication? Did he commit a crime? Immediately, he was actually making prayers. The scholar said that because the person retains in himself a feeling of shortcoming, which gives him the hint that even if he is making prayers, he is not aware he is not well prepared. He is not actually having confidence whether Allah accepted it or not. This number one. Number two, he is having a feeling of shortcoming that this type of prayer does not suit the majesty 
and the power and the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How should I feel that I did or made a tiny, minor, worthless thing which doesn't worth? So this is the meaning that a person puts. Even if he's making ibadah, he's making an act of worship which draws him closer to Allah, but he seeks Allah's forgiveness. Not in repentance, but in deep feeling of deficiency. Deep feeling also of praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because you are not the one who brought yourself to the masjid. You are not the one who brought yourself to stand in front of Allah to make prayers. You are brought by Allah. You are brought by His majesty, by His mercy. He is the one who pushed you. He is the one who guided you. He is the one who picked you up from all the rest of the people and give you the honor of standing in places of worship in front of Him. So a person should actually, when he goes or takes his path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is afraid and at the time he has good expectation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and good and positive thought that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the merciful. A person throughout his way must go in this balance. But the scholar said that when a person in his time of strength and his power on times of younghood and he's able and he is energetic and he can do more and do his best, in this case, he is supposed actually to give a better balance to the sense of fear, to the sense of what you can call fear from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But later, when he is on the verge of death, he must have some kind of the mercy or the compassion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is what we will talk about after having this short break. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. <laughs> Bismillah, walhamdulillah. We were talking about having a type of balance between fear and hope. The companions of the Prophet ﷺ gave us a lot of examples of this type of ibadah, of flying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. On the top of them, the mother of the believers, Aisha radiallahu anha, may Allah have mercy upon her. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with her. Aisha is the most beloved one to the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When she was on the verge of death, she was accompanied by Abdullah ibn Abdul Rahman and some of her righteous relatives. So Abdul Rahman ibn Abi Bakr, her brother, said that, Ya umma or Ya ukhta, oh my sister, Abdullah ibn Abbas is asking for permission to enter to visit you. And then Aisha radiallahu anha didn't pay attention. And she said, Malaka ibn Abbas, don't pay attention to ibn Abbas. Aisha actually was afraid that ibn Abbas may enter to her place. And he starts praising her. And the companions of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they didn't like too much and excessive praise. And this is not actually recommended because sometimes it may corrupt a person. So she wants actually to have a feeling of shortcomings, of deficiency in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So after a while, her brother also asked her and approached her again and said, this is Ibn Abbas, he is one of your righteous sons. Allow him to enter into your place. He would like to say a word to you. You are the mother of the believers. And he started enumerating some of the good traits of Ibn Abbas. So he was admitted to enter. And when Ibn Abbas entered, what is the first thing that he said? He said to her, be given the glad tidings of the Jannah. Be given the glad news of entering the Jannah. Because I swear by Allah and I bear witness that the Messenger وسلم, died, and you are the most beloved one to him, or to his heart. You are the closest and beloved one to his heart. And then she said, and so you are start continuing enumerating those praises? She was actually disappointed. She doesn't like him to continue. And he said, and I swear by Allah that there is no mosque in the whole Muslim world that it is still reciting the verses of Surah An-Nur, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala declared your innocence from above the heavens. So what did Aisha say? She is the mother of the believers. 
She is the most beloved one by the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He died sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in her lap. Jibreel descended from the heavens, delivering to him wahi while he was in her bed, radiallahu anha. She is one of the greatest women in the history of humanity, spreading knowledge and speaking the word of truth. So what did she say on the verge of her death? She said, لَيْتَنِي كُنْتُ نَسْيًا مَنْسِيًّا I wish I have been nothing. I wish I was not born. Aisha radiallahu anha is talking and saying that. This is a deep feeling of having this type of shortcoming, of having shyness in front of one of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the same when Umar ibn al-Khattab was on the verge of his death. When the Persian Abu Lu'lu'a stabbed him while he was making prayers in the dawn and the Fajr prayer, and the people carried him, and Umar ibn al-Khattab started asking about who killed him. And they said, this is the slave of such and such a person. He is not a Muslim. And they said, alhamdulillah, that the end of my life didn't come at the hands of a Muslim that I did wrong to him. So Umar ibn al-Khattab, when he recognized that he is going to die, and the physicians informed him about it, he said to Abdullah, his son, and he told him, Oh, my son, put my face on the dirt. And then he fell in a coma, or he slept. And when he woke, woke up, he found that Abdullah put his face on his thighs. So he said, Ya Abdullah, why you didn't put my face on the dirt? He said, what is the difference between the earth and my thigh? He says, put my face on the dirt so that the Lord of Umar know how miskin and poor and destitute is Umar for the mercy of Allah. So Allah may shower his mercy upon him. Put my face on the dirt. And he put his face on the earth. This is the personality of Umar. The one who is given the glad tidings, one of the top ten who were given the glad news while they were still alive of entering the garden of paradise. Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu is telling his son to put his face on the earth. Look at the humbleness and look how they did look and underestimated themselves. How did they look to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his majesty and the deeds and things that they do are nothing, nothing in front of the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when we remember that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam informed them about a follower, his name is Uwais al-Qarni. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to Umar ibn al-Khattab, a man will come to you one day and his name is Uwais al-Qarni. He is from Yemen from a tribe which is called the Qarn, and he is from a family which is called the Murad. And the Prophet ﷺ showed Umar ibn al-Khattab a, a trace or a sign, and he said that he has a trace of leprosy. He had leprosy, and then Allah recovered him, and there is still a spot in his skin which showed that he was diseased. So if you see him, Umar, ask him to make prayers or dua for you. So Umar ibn al-Khattab, after the death of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and after the death of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, he started receiving delegations and people, pilgrims coming from Yemen every year. And he started asking them about the tribe of Qarna and Murad. He was asking about Uwais al-Qarni. But every time they say that he didn't come because he had a mother and she is sick, and he was caring about her. And this is the reason actually Uwais al-Qarni didn't come to see the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because if a person lives at the time of the Messenger and he didn't see him, he is not regarded a companion technically. So Uwais al-Qarni sacrificed the companionship of the Prophet Sallallahu that high status, mainly for the sake of caring about his mother. So one year, Umar ibn al-Khattab was passing by the Yemenites and he said, that is this Uwais al-Qarni, he was asking about his tribe and his family and he found him. And then he approached Uwais and he said, you are Uwais? And he said, yes. 
you are from Karman, from Murad, and you had a liberty, and he showed him the spot that the Prophet ﷺ showed to him. And then he said, make dua for me, make prayers for me. Then why said, you want me to make dua for you and you are the top ten who are given the glad tidings of the Jannah? You want me, that minor one, to make dua for you, o Umar ibn Khattab? He said, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam informing me that when you see him, ask him to make dua for you. So he started making dua after receiving the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then the king of Yemen came and he started asking and searching for Uwais. And he says, make dua for me. And he said, you are a traveler. And it's better actually that you make dua for yourself. And then Umar ibn Khattab asked Uwais. And said, yeah Uwais, where are you leaving? He said, I'm leaving to Iraq. And he says, it's possible for me to write a letter to the ruler of Iraq so he takes care about you. He says, no, I don't need. I like to be like a layman, a normal man. And Uwais al-Qarni actually lived his life and nobody knows his grave because nobody knows where did he disappear because he doesn't like to show off. He doesn't like to see himself or his deeds even if the Prophet ﷺ issued a hadith regarding him that his dua is accepted. But Uwais al-Qarni didn't like to show the people that he has a grade or he has an honor or some, something like that. This is how to underestimate ourselves. This is how to show ourselves humble in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is the manner or the behavior of the Sahaba of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Fear drives you to leave what your Lord dislikes and hope pushes you forward to do what your Lord likes. To be more grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had the whole of his sins forgiven. If he has sins, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And his grades are high in the status in front of Allah. And his wives, seeing him shedding blood, his feet swollen in the depths of the night, making prayers, shedding tears, spending his life for the sake of Allah. And Aisha is approaching him. Did Allah forgive all of your sins? He said, yes. So why you are spending all of that? Why you are doing all of this? And the Prophet ﷺ said, Should I not be a grateful slave of Allah? If Allah forgives my sins, if He raised him my grades, if He showered His mercy upon me, if he blessed me with all those blessings, all those bounties, so I should be more active, more grateful to Allah, more thankful to Him subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is a very important issue that we need actually to concentrate. A person flies to Allah with hope and with fear. He is afraid of his punishment and he has mercy, an excessive mercy, a mercy which covers what is between the heavens and the earth. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to shower His mercy upon us, to give us a mercy that makes us self-sufficient with His mercy and satisfied with His mercy. وَصَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَى سَيِّدِنَا مُحَمَّدٍ وَعَلَى آلِهِ وَصَحْبِهِ وسلم. Stay away, stay away from the major sins Ignore the whispers of the shayatins Oh Lord, have mercy on our souls Stay away, stay away from the major sins Ignore the whispers of the shayatins Oh Lord, have mercy on our souls